Hi, everyone. This is Ian from Unincorporated, and I wanted to welcome you to another edition of the Higher Ed Happy Hour. Today, I'm sitting down with John Warner. John is a writer, researcher, and author of eight books, including Sustainable, Resilient, Free, The Future of Public Higher Education. So with 20 years of college teaching experience and over a decade as a contributor to the online news platform Inside Higher Ed, John has become a national voice on issues of faculty labor, institutional values, and writing pedagogy. John, welcome to the show. Oh, good to be here. Yeah, thanks for sitting down. I'd, I'd like to just maybe start with the book, your latest book, Sustainable, Resilient, Free, The Future of Public Higher Education, because you claim that this is actually a critical read for anyone invested in the future of public higher education. Uh, but first, let's qualify the title. You add the word public to specify the type of higher education. Why is that important to you? Well, so part of it is philosophical, right? I, I see public education funded at least in part by taxes and, and the pub, broader public um, arena as a kind of public good, the same way we'd look at K-12 schools or libraries or roads or, or anything like that. But really, um, part of what I've come to, to see since I sort of wrote and published the book is that we can even see some ostensibly so-called private institutions that are, are not publicly funded, but fulfill a kind of public-facing mission, right? The mission of educating people from all walks of life and improving their uh, economic, social, personal trajectories. Um, but I want us to see it as uh, education, higher education, as part of the infrastructure of society, as something that has a vital role, not just for the people who attend and receive degrees and a credential that goes into the marketplace, but as entities that actually have um, a function and purpose beyond just conferring degrees. These are institutions that are inextricably entwined with our society and have a lot of benefits to society, even for those people who are not attending them directly as students or working for them as faculty and staff. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So if I were to summarize that sentiment, the notion of public isn't necessarily a financial classification. It's more of a philosophical classification of how you view higher education. That's right. Um, you know, we have these lofty um, notions of education, right? Like education is the great equalizer. Education is the pathway to happiness and prosperity and these sorts of things. And my view is we should take those ambitions seriously, that if this is what we want education to be, we should root our approach towards how we arrange our institutions in those actual values. Yeah. And when taking things seriously, You've given us three filters in which to view that responsibility. Uh, the criteria of it being, you know, sustainable, you call out, resilient and free. So let's let's start with sustainable, that first criteria. Can you elaborate on what you mean by making public higher education more sustainable? Sure. You know, I, I wrote the book um, during kind of the the early phases of the pandemic, right, in, in 2020, as uh, it looked like a real potential existential threat to a huge swath of higher education institutions, as we knew that revenue was going to collapse and uh, there would be just this sort of huge exogenous uh, shock to the system. And I began thinking, well, if these institutions were oriented differently, what would allow them to absorb these sorts of things? So how do we make it sort of a combination of sustainable and resilient, right? How do we create a um, structure and a system where we know these things are going to be there generation after generation, um, rooted in their mission, giving people the opportunities we want to give them, rather than seeing a sort of up and down cycle of these sorts of things? You know, one of the things lots of higher education leaders are, are thinking about um, now is the so-called demographic cliff that we think is coming, where there's simply going to be fewer uh, traditional college age students. And so we can't have colleges and universities closing simply because we have a temporary dip in the number of, of uh, 18 to 22 year olds. We need to think, 
how are these institutions going to be there for when we need them and uh, to make them sustainable in that way? That goes along with resilient in being able to absorb these sorts of shocks, right? Things like uh, a pandemic or on the horizon, something like um, the global climate change, where these are obviously threats to uh, both society and the institutions themselves. So what are the things that we can do to um, create these, the bigger system and then the institutions inside the bigger system that allows them to navigate these inevitable things that come up that are a threat to um, both the institutions and society at large? Yeah. And I'm I'm curious what answers you may have uh, in terms of like safeguarding against those threats, both existential or yeah, maybe uh, driven by by current market demands. Well, one one thing my response to that would be, well, that's what the endowments are for, and the endowments have been highly criticized because you know, these universities, as we know, it's not cheap to go to a public or private university, and. Uh, and the endowments really safeguard against any of those hard times and to ensure the sustainability and resilience of an institution. Is the endowment part of the solution here? Or do you have other solutions in mind? Well, for those, for those that have them, for sure, right? Like a place like Harvard and Yale and Princeton are permanently insulated from the concerns of financial downturn, right? They, they have um, enough wealth many times over in order to to weather any sorts of bumps um, in terms of their existence. I'm sure the people running those institutions find these um, sorts of events also disrupting, but ultimately not an existential threat. The problem is for most of our public institutions, they don't have endowments that provide this sort of cover that my most recent employer, the College of Charleston, um, the endowment is somewhere around $50 million, $60 million, which sounds like a lot of money, but it's a, a, a fraction of the annual budget for the institution, right? And as a, as a sort of entity that can throw off money to be used, it's, it's relatively negligible. And that's really the case for, for most of these public institutions. So my solution for the public institution is that it's actually backed by the public, right? That it's supported by taxpayers and uh, money, and some of that money is going to come from, uh, potentially come from the wealthy institutions through um, taxes and uh, redistribution of, of those sorts of things. Um, there's certainly a lot of complications, and I, I wouldn't say that any of this is. Um, one of the things I, I often say about this is like the solution is pretty straightforward. We take this huge amount of money we have, we're an incredibly wealthy country. And we have a lot of uh, capabilities in this country. And we take some of that and we apportion it to the places where the vast majority of students already attend, places like community colleges or, or public universities. So that's straightforward. Um, but it's not uncomplicated, right? How to achieve that is actually very, very complicated and um, you know, invokes issues of politics and, and um, those sorts of things. But um, the mechanism itself is, is not unknown. It's simply a matter of um, um, how, in some cases, how much do we want to do it or um, how much those who would have to um, share some of those resources want to resist that sort of thing. And this is, you know, this is just sort of society writ large uh, imposed on higher education. This is nothing we, we don't struggle with in just about all areas of, of our culture. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And are you imagining the public funding would be at the community level? Is that the state level? Is that more of a federal program? Um, I know it is highly complicated and I want to avoid getting into the details of how this this would be implemented or rolled out, but in broad strokes, do you see it as more of a, a national effort or is it more uh, local or state? So I see it as a combination of all of the above, but essentially a partnership between states and federal government. The, as, as we all know, the federal government pours a huge amount of money currently into making higher education affordable through various programs, Pell Grant, other grants to institutions, all kinds of federal money that flows into 
um, public universities through various programs, uh, the whole student loan system, which is backed by uh, the government, right? So there's a lot of money going in, but currently with this system, it's used um, highly inefficiently, right? It does uh, not, it, it attaches to students. Um, it has a uh, high bureaucratic cost around things like Pell Grants and other things. And, uh, you know, some folks have done some calculations around, like, if we just took all the money the federal government puts into it and we just distributed it to the states, we could get close to kind of tuition free as long as states hold their current levels of funding steady. Now, being something of a realist around these things, even though I'm an idealist in, in concept, I'm a realist in, in uh, putting these concepts into work, you would need to create um, some mechanisms that incentivize states to maintain their um, upkeep of their universities. And I would even attach things like, um, uh, just as one example, uh, a, a maximum percentage of out-of-state students in a uh, state institution now, right? Like right now, universities like the University of Alabama or Clemson University, one of my former employers, are majority out-of-state students because they're competing for tuition money. They're bringing in that out-of-state tuition and it's helping them. But overall, this is damaging to um, non-flagship universities in the system. And really, you know, a, a university like Alabama or Clemson to exclude um, the citizens of Alabama or South Carolina and Clemson from their one of their flagship universities because they need to bring in revenue from wealthier kids who come from out of state is ultimately a sort of um, abrogation, I think, of the values that these institutions were established with. So I think it's a partnership. I think, um, as with a lot of things, when the federal government puts money into your state, there are strings attached, but the strings need to be oriented around the mission of the institutions and what we say we want these things to do, as opposed to sort of just um, you know, sort of pro forma accountability metrics or these kinds of things. We we really want to think about what do we want these institutions to do, and how do we want them to do it. So I'm the president of a university. I'm looking at the P and L, or maybe I'm a, a <laughs> dean, and I'm looking at the uh, the P and L statement for my college, and I don't see any federal taxpayer line items showing up on my, on my balance sheet anytime soon. Are there things we can do in the interim to make the uh, the idea of sustainable, resilient uh, yeah. programming, you know, more of a reality? It's, you know, I mean, uh, point taken, right? Like it's there, there's what we can do. And then there's the world we live in presently and the world doesn't stop. Um, there's new students are going to come in the fall and, and these things are going to keep going. My, um, one of the reasons why I advocate for this sort of funding system is because I believe there's a disconnect between uh, mission, the educational and research mission of an institution, and what I call operations, which is embodied uh, for me in a quote um, that Carol Christ, who's uh, currently the chancellor of the University of California system, but at the time she said this, I think she was a, a vice chancellor, something like that. And she said, this was in 2016, um, colleges and universities are fundamentally in the business of enrolling students for tuition dollars. And she's not wrong, right? If you do not have revenue and you don't have tuition, you do not exist. But that reality distorts the mission of the institution, where the need to keep enrolling students and compete for students and use students as sources of funding and revenue uh, cuts against the mission of education research, um, human development, uh, community service, and all these things that universities provide. I'll give one quick example of, uh, of where this happens. This was a couple years ago. Michigan State University uh, had done a bunch of research and found that students who live in the dorms um, for more than just the first year do better in all kinds of ways. They do better academically. They do better socially. Um, it's, it's, we know from a lot of research, this is a good thing for the benefit of students. They tried to um, initiate this policy and the students rebelled. 
because they almost universally saw it as a university money grab from the students as a, a um, motivated by simply drawing more money out of the students. And um, I looked into it and, I, and it was clear this was not the motive. The motive was pure. The motive was mission-based. But the way that the relationship between the student and the institution had been established had created this great distrust. And so we see these things over and over where people worry about students only worried about grades or the credential or these sorts of things. I think this underlying dynamic is at work in all of these things. So if, if we can see the ways to align the mission, even in absence of the sort of big structural change that I advocate for, but if we can think of what is the mission here, what are we trying to achieve? How do we uh, communicate that to students? How do we treat students as stakeholders rather than customers? I think this, this will help, right? Like it's, it's not a game changer, but it is the mindset around how we relate to students and how we communicate to them and the sorts of um, programs and policies we uh, visit upon them. It can make a difference if, if it feels as though, um, you know, this is not a sort of purely transactional relationship between student and, and institution. Yeah. And I think that's where communications plays a vital role is really being able to it like in that example that you just shared, could we have in some way exemplified the actual reason behind making that operational change and, you know, try to connect, you know, more, um, more clearly with the student, what the true intent is and somehow clear uh, any of that negativity or perhaps that misconception I think in terms of the disconnect that you describe between mission and operations and this overarching market factor or this market pressure that creates a, a misalignment between mission and operations, uh, I think you see that not only in the ways that this, the institution enrolls and recruits students because they are, after all, <laughs> where the cash flow comes from, but it's also, I've seen it on how... Um, the curriculum is designed. So you get a lot of courses and programs retooling their curriculum to be more career focused, which isn't necessarily the mission, especially say within a liberal arts education, it's not necessarily the mission to get a job after college. So this market factor is playing a role, I think, not only in the way that the universities are being run, but also in the way that the education and the learning outcomes are being designed. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think one of the, we've gotten in a sort of uh, doom loop of this where uh, students feel pressure um, because of the cost of, of higher education, a pressure to go into a good major that's going to pay off in a job. Um, universities then in turn feel the pressure to give them sorts of programs that will lead to these good jobs. But really, and this is rooted very much in my, you know, career as a, as a um, kind of just frontline instructor, primarily of, of, um, you know, like general education courses, the stuff that students don't actually want to take and wonder what they're there for. Um, I've actually found if you, if you break underneath that attitude, which they often arrive with, the vast majority of students arrive at college or university wanting to learn things. They do want to learn. They are often um, skeptical that learning things is actually what the institution and the courses and the major and the courses and the professors are interested in. So, you know, I, I would sometimes have to spend a lot of upfront time saying like, no, 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 I really, we're here to learn stuff. It's not just to get past this course and get your credit and move on to the next thing. But this attitude is, is um, you know, to your point, it's pretty pervasive and it takes some undoing and it's entirely explicable kind of based on the, on the system the students have experienced it prior to college, right? They've been told, particularly this, the, the current generation of students really has been oriented towards college and career since they were in kindergarten. And they've been experiencing um, what I, what I call um, indefinite delayed benefit, where everything they do in school is for some future benefit, never in the present, um, 
never just for its own sake, but because uh, you're going to get into a good college, you're going to score well in your SATs, you're going to get AP credit that will shorten your time to degree, or you're going to get a job and all these kinds of things. And so that student skepticism, I think, is is um, explicable, um, you know, sort of well-earned in a way, like why would they believe otherwise? But um, I, I very much agree with your point where we emphasize things other than learning, where we emphasize the sort of, um, where we emphasize credentialing, where we emphasize how the degree is going to pay off as opposed to uh, the kinds of experiences that we're going to go through on our way to a degree. Um, it undercuts that mission, right? And, and, and it tends to make students more suspicious of the motives of the institution itself because they just see themselves as a kind of means to the end for the institution. Yeah. I, I have a, a slightly different way of, I think, recontextualizing what you just shared there and communicating the value ultimately that you receive from your educational experience. So we're, we're so focused on the result, the, you know, the quantitative result that this education will provide to me, the learner. And that's in business terms, ROI, right? It's the return on your investment. I'm going to put dollars in and I'm going to get dollars out. So I've, I've tried to reposition that ROI as, no, this is the reach of impact. This is the amount of impact that you're making on yourself as a transformative experience. And to your, I think to your point, you're saying that this is going to have lifelong lasting changes and impact the reach of the impact of this educational experience is going to be long lasting far after graduation. So thinking of ROI, not just on the business and the quantitative side, but also on the qualitative side. Well, and uh, you know, to your point, I think one of the mistakes the industry has made in general is um, what I think is an ultimately fruitless search for a quantifier of the value of a college degree, right? That, return on investment, ROI. Mm -hmm. um, the, the qualitative, like we live our lives in the qualitative space uh, on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis. And, um, you know, I'm a guy with three English degrees uh, who has had a huge variety of experiences and professional experiences. I've been a market research consultant. I'm an education consultant now. I do speeches all over the country. I write a newspaper column. Um, I've written novels and humor books. It's like, and I'm, uh, you know, just a middle-aged guy who's got some miles under his tires, but have some miles to go still. And it's kind of like, it's fun, right? Like it should be interesting. And I, what I really, one of the things I worry about the current, the experiences of the current generations of students is they're not kind of being shown those possibilities that anything could happen to them in the future. And your degree is not your destiny. Your your field of study is not your destiny, but if you get curious, if you want to learn and um, keep your eyes open, you might have some interesting things happen to you along the way. Yeah. Well said. All right. So before we get into learning outcomes and what colleges and universities should be teaching in this new era, post pandemic era, let's, uh, let's touch on the last criteria of your book, mm -hmm. which is free. So mm -hmm. part of this, framework that you're presenting includes ultimately free access to education. Is that right? Or do you, are you clarifying yeah, no, that's, the word free? In a yeah. Part way? of it is, so part of it is free as in tuition free, or um, let, let me put it kind of um, more pragmatically where cost is not a barrier to entry for those who qualify and would like to pursue post-secondary education. And I really include post-secondary education beyond just college and university, right? Like uh, I'm all for apprenticeship programs and anything else like that. I think one of the problems we've had with, with um, four-year colleges and universities is suggesting that those are the only routes towards happiness and prosperity. We, we know that's not the case and we should be more mindful of, of all the different paths people can take, but also free in the sense of like freeing, kind of like what we were just talking about, where students don't feel pressure to major in something that they're not particularly interested in because they think it's going to pay off. If they want to be a history major or philosophy major or French major or English major or creative writing major, as I was, these should be options to them that don't feel as though they are consigning themselves to some sort of future life of poverty or 
deprivation or anything like that. And so, um, and, uh, you know, to also have everybody who's in the institution feel free to um, speak their minds and live their lives according to their own desires and um, not be subject to uh, um, sudden termination simply for expressing a different idea and this kind of stuff. And, and this gets into issues of academic freedom uh, and, and this sort of thing. But as somebody who spent his entire teaching career, you know, off the tenure track, just as a non-tenure track instructor, mostly full-time, but occasionally adjunct part-time. Um, I never, you know, I never had those things. And uh, the number of times it impacted how I was able to do my work is sort of off the charts uncountable. And not just in the academic freedom sense, in the, um, for the six years I was working at Clemson University, my, and this was from 2005 to 2011, so it's improved somewhat since, but I was making, my salary was $25,000 a year to teach eight courses a year. And that's simply not, um, well, it's not sustainable as an individual, right? The only reason I could do it was because I had outside income as a writer and editor and these sorts of things and a, and a well-employed spouse who could, um, uh, Bring home the bulk of our, our household income. Ultimately, this is just this is not the route to a well functioning institution, and it constrains the freedom. Right? Um, if I had my way, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I'd be in the midst of my end of semester work wherever I'm uh, teaching. But uh, you know, ultimately, the opportunity cost of being in my uh, late forties and making many multiples below what I could make going out even freelance on my own, ended my teaching career. Um, and this is not consistent with values of like freedom and choice and this kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, these, uh, these institutions should be, in theory, set up um, to embody these things because they're awesome and they're incredible. And they have all these the work you get to do inside a university is essentially oriented around freedom, freedom of your own mind, freedom of inquiry, exploration, all those kinds of things. And yet we've, we've set up all of these barriers to these things because of the way the, the system and the institutions are structured. If you remove those things, amazing, right? If somebody just come to you and say, we're going to pay you uh, $50,000 a year, with cost of living increases for the rest of your life to teach uh, four sections of student writing every semester, I would have taken it in a heartbeat. But those jobs are actually rare and hard to come by. Um, and they shouldn't be because we need people to do that. We need students to learn how to write. We need people to do it. Um, for whatever reason, we have a system that um, does not um, support that sort of work. And that's what I mean by free where we can have those things. Yeah. Well, you've covered a lot of ground there thinking through the student's perspective, the faculty or the adjunct perspective, and then the perspective of the institution. Uh, I too was adjunct uh, for many years and same situation. It was only because I had full-time employment for my agency to support those endeavors. So for me, this was like community service to give back to, to, um, you know, to an institution or, or to an industry, uh, in a way that, you know, felt, I guess, very valuable and freeing for me, but not from a financial standpoint, certainly mm -hmm. not. Uh, we'll have to double your salary for the, for what we're paying you for this podcast, <laughs> maybe to make up for lost ground, but, um, thank you for your service. Of course. It just seems like we're in such a, a gridlock though, right? Because from the institution standpoint, the reason they, they leverage adjuncts is because people like us who they can bring in top quality talent in order to teach who are maybe giving back. Uh, and then adjuncts are also variable costs, right? So it's a way for them to decrease their expense and still keep the quality, the freeing quality of the education alive and well. But it's it's not working. It's it's like it's it's broken in a way. So, do you see any other than this idea of a, you know taxpayers kind of unifying together? What else can we do? How how do we solve this gridlock? So, I mean, some of it I do think um, 
there's constraints, right? There's constraints about revenue and resources and, and that kind of thing. I think the first step, and really this is a step for for leaders on campus, is to have frank discussions about where the disconnects between mission and operations are. And then uh, this only happens incrementally, but you you try to bring along the uh, teaching and learning conditions to be commensurate with what you actually believe is necessary for the work to be done well. We have guidelines around these things. We have guidelines around, um, I was a writing teacher, so uh, the National College for Teachers of English says um, an instructor should have um, uh, ideally three sections of 15 students, total of 45 per semester, maximum of 20 per section, 60 an institution can set that as a goal. We are going to have these conditions. We are going to try to meet these conditions. Um, that was rare in my career. I had semesters where I'd have over 200 students in writing intensive courses. But if we can set these goals and can um, create actual targets and benchmarks against which to uh, measure ourselves, we can make progress. One of the things that happened uh, at, while I was at College of Charleston, um, which was, again, not um, as far as one would like, but incremental is they took um, what they called full-time adjuncts, essentially part-time workers who were teaching the equivalent of a full load and um, were able to give them a little bit of a salary bump and make them eligible for health insurance. Now, they were still underpaid, they were still overworked, but being eligible for health insurance through the state plan is a huge benefit. And it's great progress. So it's not that we have to reach the finish line in a week, right? But we have to be able to uh, identify what the conditions for um, good conditions of teaching and learning look like on the ground and how do they manifest themselves. And, you know, I, I look around and I, I give talks and I, I consult and I see places where this, this can and is, is happening, but it's it's really takes a lot of, um, the cavalry isn't coming in to, to help. It really is. A, it really is about the inside the institution making a concerted push to improve these things and make these, um, you know, a priority consistent with the values. And to be, um, my experience of observing those also is is uh, that the teaching force, the non tenure track teaching force, can often approach that with a lot of goodwill um, if they see it as. Um, oriented around values and the good. And the other thing that's that's happening, um, you know, big picture right now is unionization is having a huge impact on these things um, in many different contexts. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, um, I'm a pro-union guy. I'm, I'm pro-labor. I see myself as a, as a laborer first when I work for these institutions. So um, that's having an effect. So um, you know, institutions are, are going to find themselves in collective bargaining instances where they have less control. So it's in some cases, it may be in their interest to start orienting around these questions. So there's there's um, less acrimony and, and um, less chance of these sorts of, of things happening. Yeah. And in terms of looking within and, and seeing any disconnect between mission and operations, one thing that came to mind as you're describing that so in my experience, the the learning outcomes were attainable in a shorter amount of class time. So my salary didn't change, but the administration said, okay, we can actually move this to one day a week, you know, lecture and lab versus the two or three days that I was required to be there. And so I, th I think there are ways to um, innovate or maybe around the operations in, in ways that don't sacrifice the mission and maybe get us closer to these goals that you're describing. Does this also touch upon how we make education more accessible and affordable to, to all people, regardless of their socioeconomic background? Is, is that a, is a similar answer to look within for, for ways to work toward this goal? Or are there other ways that institutions can work toward this goal of access and affordability? I mean, you know, for sure, the external support and um, incentives plays a big role. But again, inside the institutions, if they believe in the mission of accessibility, things can be done to make the institution more accessible. And, and 
you know, there's a lot of folks who are studying these things and, and finding um, really pretty straightforward things that help students. And not just in terms of admissions, but like transportation or food insecurity. Or um, to your point, like how many days of week a class meets or when it meets. Um, there's just a story in Inside Higher Ed just this morning as we're recording about um, how a lot of working students are taking advantage of the high flex um, course structure, which um, did not work great during the pandemic for a lot of students because they don't see themselves as high flex students. But for the ones who are like, yes, I, I, I want to attend, but I can't always, but I need a way to keep up when I can't, it makes a huge difference in terms of allowing those students to persist. And so if we, if we don't look at students as sort of a monolith, but instead, and I, I think this is, I, I, have a, I have this background in research and market research. I'm a big believer in go talk to the students. Like um, even at the class level, if somebody's not showing up, it's like, why are you not showing up? And uh, particularly like in 8 a.m., uh, I had a student, uh, you know, I have dozens of these stories from over the years. I'm sure you do too if, from teaching. I had the same student who was 20 minutes late every single day to my 8 a.m. course, right? Three days a week. And I finally asked her, you know, what's, and she was a good student, diligent, everything other than, than showing up on time, which constantly had her scrambling to keep up. And she eventually said, uh, she just told me she had a young kid who she had to drop off at school, could not drop her child off any earlier than a certain time, which did not leave her enough time to get to school, it left her enough time to get to school, did not leave her enough time to park because of the way the parking worked at the institution. And so that's a problem we can solve. We can say, I have a student with a unique set of circumstances. She needs a dedicated parking spot that's not a mile and a half away where you make all the students park. And we solved it. And to me, that's just one example. Every student has something like that, right? And if we, and likely as you talk to the students individually, these problems will cluster and you can make policies and you can make arrangements. And these barriers that don't have to exist come down and soon we have a more efficient use of resources. We're not having students uh, fail out because of parking problems or transportation problems or food insecurity. And we are fulfilling the mission of doing what these awesome institutions are capable of doing in ways other institutions are not. That's kind of my, my message is, is like the, the, um, the role of these institutions in society is unique. So let's take advantage of it and make the best use of them that we can. Yeah. And, and this idea of high flex, and, and I'm just thinking of your example there with the parking situation and, and being high flex, like you as a, as an educator, you, you were flexible in that moment. You were able to have that conversation and make an innovative, flexible solution that didn't impact. I'm thinking that that idea of high flex could actually be between faculty and student, but it could be also between Dean <laughs> and faculty. And it could be is, between the president's yes. office and the deans, right? Like, how do we become more high flex throughout the entire institution? This is, yeah, this is um, this. That's an excellent point because one of the things that always frustrated me was the steady drain of talent out of the institution, um, and I'm not just talking about myself, but the over and over again, people who did not fit into the prescribed slots that the institution had for them, right? Um, maybe didn't want to pursue a tenure track job or maybe only had um, maybe could only teach uh, fall or only teach spring, but we don't have capacity to bring them in and do this. And that the, the, the administration, because of policy, because of bureaucracy, because of lack of agency and freedom among some of those administrators, were not given the tools or latitude that allows them to solve those problems, right? Like if I have a great instructor who can only teach half the year, um, but I see the outcomes of their students are like awesome and I want to keep them as part of my institution because, hey, maybe someday they can do the whole year and it's just now. Um, I want to try to find a way to hold on to that person. And and this is, you know, I'm a, I'm a 
uh, sort of uh, died in the wool lefty, uh, progressive uh, college professor writer type. But a lot of what I think about these things are lessons I learned working in corporate America on sort of the way my employers in those uh, situations worked really hard to hold on to talent because it was, um, if you had somebody who was contributing to your organization, it's much more costly and much uh, much harder to replace them to, than to simply give them something that's going to keep them in the fold, happy, productive. You're going to get much more value out of that person. Unfortunately, you know, higher education institutions with the way they're oriented, they let amazing talent, um, particularly at the at the staff and instructor level, particularly at the staff level where there's there's nowhere to go, right? If you're a staff person, they walk away constantly. And this is not good for institutions. Um, but the number of times I've heard a dean or a, a provost uh, sort of sigh and say, you know, my hands are tied because they are, you know, it, it's it's enough to kill you after a while. Um, it's it's not that they're wrong, but you sort of wonder, well, why is the, why does this have to be the case? And if we all agree it doesn't work, let's let's figure out what does work. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's turn our our focus to a different topic before we we look to close here. I, I know that one of the themes in your book was around student preparation and really making sure that students are feeling prepared for a rapidly changing environment, especially this post pandemic environment and world we live in. I think the pandemic in a way actually prepared students. And that was one of the messages I took to class was, Hey, this might feel really terrible having to take your class in the closet on your laptop (laughs) because mom is making kitchen outside or making dinner in the kitchen outside. But this is actually giving you the skills that you'll need. And now with this high flex, some students are opting for high flex because they've learned those skills. So I think in some ways, pandemic taught us how to, it trained us on ways to operate in this new norm that we're, that we're all experiencing. Um, but how else should we be teaching and preparing students for the 21st century today? Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of uh, sometimes I feel kind of old school on this, but I'm I'm very um, I'm sort of major or discipline agnostic. I'm much more about how do we turn everybody into a good critical thinker, a good consumer of um, media and stimulus and, and knowing what's true and what's not true and adapting to change and these sorts of things. You know, one of the things with the with the release of chat GPT, right? The generative AI um, technology has been a huge boost to, to my personal bottom line because I have this background in teaching writing and have written a couple of books about it. And all of a sudden everybody wants to talk to me about it. I don't have any tech background. I I'd, uh, played around with this stuff when it was an earlier version. But what I realized is, oh, I learned how to learn. I learned how to get myself up to speed on on these things, even though I was not f- familiar with the tech or large language models or anything to do with it. And that's what I want students to be able to do is to to have the um, mindset and skills that allow them to adapt. Right. Um, the idea that we need to. Uh, you know, sort of spin up a chat GPT or generative AI major doesn't make any sense to me. We 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 don't know what this technology is going to look like or, or be like uh, six months from now, let alone three years or five years from now. So the idea that we need to start training around this stuff, I think, is wrong. We need to help students be prepared for that change. And I think that your pandemic example is is well taken, right? The whole world had to change how they did things almost overnight. And we learned a lot from that. And I think teaching in a lot of ways has benefited from that. I've, I've talked to a lot of teachers that um, in the aftermath of the pandemic have jettisoned practices that they, they clung to prior to the pandemic that they were like, I guess that wasn't important, right? Um, and it, it, it's allowed space for other things to come in. So it, it's not that we shouldn't have majors. It's not that um, a degree is a free-for-all and a smorgasbord and this kind of stuff. We should really, I think, we should be orienting around the kinds of experiences that allow people to come out as sophisticated thinkers, knowing themselves, understanding how they interact and intersect with the world, and 
giving them the confidence and agency to know what direction they want to go, right? I, I, I think that's a, a huge part of the process, particularly for traditional age college students, right? Some of the you know older students who come, they often know what they're there for. But um, you know, for me, college was like, I don't know what I'm here for. I don't know what I want to do. And because um, I'm old enough, I went to college in an era where I was allowed to figure it out and stumble and make mistakes and and um, you know keep learning and growing over the course of of four years and, and beyond. And that's what I want to give to students today to have the kind of resources and then chance to try and fail and uh, make connections and have mentors. I think that's the stuff that ultimately pays off long term. Yeah. Well, you've you've hit a, a number of points. I'm just going to mirror back some some of which that I heard, which resonated with me. So, in in an era today where there's so much AI technology available, so so many deep fakes, you layer that onto you layer the algorithm onto those deep fakes, where you're actually getting served media that is uh, specific to your behaviors, and that media may or may not be true. <laughs> So the idea of critical thinking as it applies to good and responsible consumption of media, learning how to be a responsible consumer of media, amen. Yes, that is a, <laughs> that is a great skill we should be teaching. Uh, learning how to learn, you know, I think, I feel like that is an evergreen one and, and you know, super applicable today in light of this um, influx of information overload in media. And then maybe circling back to just the somewhat of the theme that we've touched on today is being mission focused as a provider of educational media, as a as a provider of, you know, the media or the content that happens and occurs within a learning environment. So being mission focused in that regard, but then also maybe being mission focused as a consumer of education, as a, as a student and really aligning around your values and the mission of, of what you want as a learner. So trying to summarize some, some key points yeah. there that you've, you've I, laid out. For like, me. like the, you know, the traditional go to, go to college to figure out what you want to do with your life. is a, it's a pretty good reason to go. Um, and to, to, um, you know, live a life that's happy and fulfilling and interesting, not just where you think about how am I going to make the most amount of money possible? I mean, we all want to be comfortable. We all want to be secure. But, um, you know, I'll take happy under that umbrella um, any day. And we all need help figuring that out. And college is a great place to, to start to learn that. Yes. Any, that's a great final thought. But any other final thoughts that you'd like to leave the listeners with? The, the biggest thing um, I... So I, I waffle between sort of uh, skepticism that we can change. Um, when I look at the big picture, I'm like, oh, man, this is a really big thing. But then when I travel from place to place to give a talk and I'll, you know, one of the things I, I try to do if I, if I give a talk somewhere is set aside time to talk to students or staff or faculty. And every single place I go, I see amazing things happening. I see great change. I see mission oriented people. I see a lot of people who are trying to make the lives of the people who intersect with the institution better. So I know it's happening and I know it's possible. And so really we just need to give those people more time, more resources, more space, more freedom in order to do that because the, the will is there among a lot of people. The, the person power is there. Um, there's some barriers in the place and there's a lack of resources, but it's not for lack of knowing what we need to do. And so that's when I get encouraged, right? Big picture, I get a little despairing, but then when you get on the ground, you're like, man, that's, that's cool. With this spring, I've been to seven or eight different in person after the pandemic for the first time, like in virtual talks and person talks and every single stop along the way, all different kinds of institutions, something amazing is happening and if you can identify those things and build on them, then progress can happen. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's a, uh, it's a delight to sit down. I feel like we should bring you back the half of our conversation. We didn't even get to, uh, but I'm really grateful for the time that we did share today. It's just been a pleasure. And as always, you've provided your listeners, your readers with a lot to think about uh, a lot to chew on. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, it's really fun for me. Thanks for having me.